Hey guys, welcome back to my garage. In this video, I'm going to go over the Klausen Candia. It's about finished up. Very tiny loose ends left for me to take care of. Um, I want to do a walk around, kind of describe a few things, and then we'll cut a uh, test block on it. I'm sorry to do many videos on it. Uh, originally, I was going to do an oak, and I was going to do Dyne 4. Uh, AC drives and AC servo motors, but that didn't work out because the motors being as big as they are wouldn't fit on the uh, x-axis mount without modifying the table and I did not want to cut into the table. I wanted to make it uh, as clean as I could possibly make it. I had a set of three uh, Centroid DC brush servos, so I switched gears and I uh, modified those uh, DC brush servos. They had square flanges and the X and the Y needed a round flange, so I basically cut them off and uh, turned the flange around and uh, um, drilled and tapped them to work on the machine. So they did work out well. Um, the, those motors had MS connectors, military spec connectors on them. I didn't want to go through cutting them off and that sort of thing. Uh, the motor worked just fine on the Y because I was able to point the MS connector down. Uh, on the X, I had to point it forward and I had to make a little cover to protect it um, because uh, if I would have pointed that one down, it would have run into the... Uh, into the knee when the X was heading in that direction. I'll show you that here in just a second. Um, but it was a minor detail and uh, just covering up the, uh, uh, the MS connector worked out just fine. So let's go over the machine. I'll go over and go over the cabinet and uh, kind of give you an overview of what's what. Okay, here's that cover. Um, the the Candia has this uh, has this big cover on the front of it, and its primary job is to protect the x-axis servo, which is sitting right underneath this cover. The MS connector pokes out just a little bit. I had to cut a little hole for the connector to come out, and then as you see, I created the cover, I bushed, bushed it, and then brought the cables out, and then I have a, what's called a strain relief here, to keep the cables out of the way when the x-axis is uh, all the way positive and that's the way this machine homes. It homes x positive, y positive, and of course z positive. Um, so anyway, that's, that's that. Um, here I've got the uh, portable jog pendant, um, just like a uh, virtual control panel. Um, it, basically that's what VCP is mimicking is this uh, jog panel. Uh, these stop buttons right here, feed right over right here, um, and so forth. Um, so uh, this is uh, a touch screen, uh, resistive touch screen, and a Logitech K400 Plus keyboard. I like using them because they're inexpensive, they're relatively small, and I can get these uh, silicone skins on, on them. I can get these silicone skins for the keys and then it's got a touch pad here. So chips don't really make a lot of difference. Um, they're wireless so you can remove it, put it wherever you want, hold it if you want. But uh, typically you don't do much with the keyboard but it's handy to have. Um, so there's the Y axis and it's also got a cover on it. And um, Again, like I said, the x-axis has a cover and the motors here. A lot of these knee mills have the motors sticking out and uh, it ends up eating up some, some shop space. I'm going to cover these cables with some uh, nylon split loom. Um, not that cheap plastic stuff that you see in cars, but it's a nylon split loom. I'm going to cover them back to the cabinet. Okay, well, let's go around over here. So this is uh, a 3D printed cap. It's actually uh, designed after Centroid's uh, servo motor um, cable strain reliefs that you can buy from them. And it's turned out to work out really well. So I've got a large hole drilled into this original steel uh, operator console mount. And it's deburred, um, so it doesn't cut anything, but it allows getting um, cables back into the uh, into the cabinet down here. And then I've got a 22 millimeter single station uh, enclosure here um, with uh, USB, two USB ports. The lower one is Wi-Fi and then the upper one is so that um, you can load, 
programs or you can do uh, backups of your uh, reports on the machine and so forth. So that turned out pretty well. It's easily accessible. It's very, very stout support. It was very heavy um, to host support the original operator's console. This is just an aluminum plate. Um, can hang stuff on the front side to the left of the monitor uh, and so forth. Uh, let's go ahead and look inside the cabinet. Give you as best a view as I can. Using a, a Hitachi SJ100 VFD here. This is a 220 to 120 step down transformer. It's used primarily, I put it in there primarily uh, for the lube pump because it's 120 volts. Um, that's, and uh, um, let's see, and it's also being used for the pneumatic uh, solenoid. Um, the solenoid on this machine, which you can see right around here on the corner, is 120 volts. So I just, I had it, so I installed it. And then you see I marked on it, it's T3, 240 to 120 for the lube pump and the solenoid power. And if somebody wants to add mist, they could use 120 volts to drive that solenoid as well if they want to do mist. Um, E-stop contactor, this is the uh, uh, breakout block for that transformer, 120 volts. Um, neutral on the top, 120 volts on the bottom, of course, chassis ground. Um, fuses, left two fuses are for the VFD, right two fuses are for the control. Down here is a 24 volt AC uh, step down transformer. That drives the uh, e-stop contactor. And then we have the transformer that will step down 240 volts to uh, 79 volts AC. And then once it's rectified, I think it gives me like 119 volts of DC for the all-in-one DC motion controller and the DC servos in this machine. Over here on the left side is a typical TB1 terminal block. Um, I am feeding this machine with 240 volt 30 amp circuit. So the upper three terminals are one phase and the second three terminals are the other phase. So between the two is 240 volts. Um, the monitor and this uh, Lenovo Tiny PC and its bracket there, their, their power supplies are down here. They're fed from these uh, two amp fuses, a pair of them there, one for each phase, and then they go up here to uh, the terminal blocks. I believe it's three, 3B three and 6B. Um, I did that because I wanted to make sure that if something happens with the power supplies that it blows those supply fuses first. Um, so, and then this little fuse here, this F5, it's a two amp fuse. That's for the uh, control circuit for the e-stop contactor and that's covered in the schematic. Otherwise, everything's pretty much the same. Um, this, uh, the outputs, the lube pump, no fault, that's all the same. Flood is unused right now, and uh, mist is wired and ready. Um, and then this clamp circuit, I'm actually using that, uh, output six, to drive the brake. And let me show you. There's the solenoid that came on the machine, a filter and a regulator. I have it at about 100, about 100, is that 110 PSI right now? It goes up here, where on a typical knee mill you have a brake. Um, and that brake is actuated right now. The spindle is locked. The reason being is this is an Ericsson quick change uh, spindle. So all the tools go in and out here you. You need to use the uh, spanner wrench use a spanner wrench to pop the tool out, and then you use the spanner wrench to lock the tool in. So it's important for that to be locked. Now you're wondering, well, if that's locked, how does the spindle work? Well, there's been a modification done. Uh, Mark Leonard, CNC Services uh, uh, Northwest, made a little modification so that it's normally locked, but when you call motion, let's go ahead and turn the spindle on. I'm gonna take it off. Uh, auto and put it on manual and as soon as I hit that you might hear the solenoid click see it unlocks the spindle and then I can hit that and there's actually a timer so right now it's free um, I'm you can just hear it locked so in parameters I can tell it how long 
uh, before it relocks that spindle. So uh, doing a little bit of experimentation. This machine does not have a brake, a braking resistor yet for the VFD, but I'm installing one. And because it is an email and all the tool changes are done down here, there is no, there's no draw bar at the top. So what that does is it leaves the top of the spindle free so one could put a spindle encoder up there. And uh, depending on how long I have the machine, I may fit one up there and then uh, uh, set it up for rigid tapping. Um, so um, anyway, there's one of the uh, Centroid DC brush servos. The Z happens to have the square flange on it, so I didn't have to change that out. And um, what I did to calibrate the, the control will contr control the spindle speed. So what I did is I calibrated, I, I, turned the, uh, I turned the variable speed mechanism on the head so that the spindle speed and the, the spindle rate on CNC 12, they all equate. So if I call an uh, M3S 2000, it's turning at 2000 RPM, okay? So uh, anyway, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to touch on. Um, using the original or these DC brush servos, I didn't have to change pulleys or anything like that. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the machine. Um, it's got a lube pump, 120 volts. One thing I don't like about it is it doesn't have a float switch. So when it's low and it's getting low, um, there's no alarm. So I need to put some oil in that thing. That's the drawback to that particular pump. So the user's got to pay attention to it. We're going to cut this test block. This, this uh, round is one inch. I believe the diamond is inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter, and then the square is 1.9 inches. By cutting this test block, you can measure the features in two directions, and it kind of helps see how well your machine is tuned, how well you, uh, you fine-tune the DROs. So uh, anyway, let me, uh, I've already got the, this is our blank. I have the same size block on this side to equalize pressure on this vise. I've already set my lower left corner to zero, zero. Top of my part is zero. I've already set all that up on the machine. Um, so it should just be a matter of pressing a cycle start and letting it go. And I'll just squirt a little WD-40 on it every so often and then we'll measure the block. I'm hanging out a little bit over here, but should be fine. Most of it's here just to equalize pressure. Let me get these off so they don't make any noise when the machine's running. Just give a little bit of WD. And I'm going to go ahead and press cycle start over here. Let you see up at the control. I'm, I'm in the graphics mode waiting for the cycle start button. I'm gonna press cycle start. And it's asked me to do a tool change. The tool's already in there. And it says press auto spindle to continue. Well, you remember I, I changed that. First operations to face the part. It will come 
back and do a finish pass on all three uh, features of the part. doing its finish pass. Okay, the part's done. Let me get a rag and my calipers and uh, we'll check the part. Okay, if everything turned out well, this boss should be one inch, however I measure it, and then the diamond should be an inch and a quarter, and the square should be 1.9. Hopefully you can see that, it's an inch that way. Also an inch that way. Let's check the diamond. We can see that's 1.25 that way. Got some schmutz there. 1.2505 that way. I may not have it exactly right. Oh, we got some. Wipe that off. Okay, yeah, so that's within half a thou. Let's check this one.
1.90, hopefully you can see that. So I'm pretty happy with that part on this, this uh, knee mill. This Klausing is actually in, in pretty decent shape. Uh, let, me, uh, let me show you what the backlash was. I'll take you up to the, to the monitor so you can take a peek. You know, we got glare any which way you look at. We got some glare there. Hopefully you can see it. So I'll go into F1 setup, F1. F3 config, 137, enter, uh, machine motor. Okay, there you can see the lash on X was 5 tenths, on Y it was 8 tenths, and Z it was almost imperceptible. So as you can tell, this machine was in pretty darn good shape. I was surprised. I bought the machine not working. The original control was a Delta control, and it had issues, um, but you know, I always take a chance on buying a machine when you can't see it run or you can't check lash, you can't listen to the spindle, that sort of thing. But just a little tip, the reason why I bought it, it still has its original paint. And if you kind of, you know, the machine is not beat up. I did wipe it down, but it's not all chipped to hell. There wasn't marks on the table. It had a pressure lube pump. So I felt like there's always, there's a, usually a good fair chance a machine was taken care of and didn't see a real hard life. So I always look at that before making a decision to buy a machine. And I'm particular about buying the machine. I don't, if something's really beat up, it's scrap value to me. Um, because there's the chance that uh, you don't know what you're getting into. So I felt pretty good about this old girl, Secundia FV-1. And because it was so clean and so original and not beat up, not chipped up on the column here, you don't see any chip. It had a way cover on it. Um, you look at the column, it's not all beat up like you'd normally see knee mills. Um, I put a new rubber cover on it. By the way, this is a shower pan liner from Home Depot. Um, cheap, you can get it by the foot, cut it down to what you want, and then it makes inexpensive, inexpensive way cover. Uh, anyway, that's it. Uh, it's a wrap on the Candia. Um, got a few details to do to it. I'm going to do a little bit more testing on it, but she's done. So I just wanted to bring this video series to a closure. If you have any questions, leave comments down below. I'll try and answer them. Um, again, it was an all-in-one DC, Centroid all-in-one DC motion controller using the Centroid DC brush servos. The, um, they're made by SEM. They're 29 pound inch, I think is what it is, 29 pound inch or inch pound. I get them confused. Uh, torque. Um, and uh, so anyway, there you go. Another one done. Take care. See you in the next one.